Well, good morning. Welcome to Online Church. Awesome to be with you on Flying Solo. After weeks of having Pastor Karen with us, and then last week, Catherine, Isaac, and Gary, just a brilliant job. You got me this morning. So I really trust that we're going to have a fantastic time in the Lord. I know God wants to speak with us. Why don't, in fact, why don't you already in the comments, and thank you for all the comments already, but why don't you put in the comments, is this the declaration that God wants to speak with us today? Start throwing those in. That'd be absolutely brilliant. Hey, this morning I would have invited around about 150 friends to come and join us. Uh, so to all of my friends who are coming online because of that Facebook message, hey, welcome along. You actually are special. It wasn't just sort of a crazy blanket send out. I really have been praying for you guys. So to everybody who's leaning in for either the first time or maybe you're new to this, to all of our friends and family at Abundant Life Church, uh, hey, I believe that God is up to something really fantastic. We sometimes know him as Jehovah Jireh, my provider, Jehovah Nissi. His banner over us is love. I sometimes think that he's Jehovah Sneaky and that he actually sneaks up on us. He's been doing some things in our life, revealing some stuff in us, drawing stories and gifts to the surface. I'm really believing that today we're going to explore that just a little bit more. So, hey, thanks for being with us. I don't have anybody to bounce around off, so I'm just going to really plow in. We're starting a new series uh, today on connecting, caring, and engaging. We have got a, a vision or a, or a connect book that we'd love to be able to send out to you. You can email us at hello at abundant.org.au. You can find us all around the place and just say, hey, I'd like one of your digital connect books. And in that, it outlines our mission, our vision, our values, our culture, some of our stories, some of our mandate to love. And that's really fun. But the way that we've been expressing our mission and our mission being to connect with God is through the vehicle of connection and care and then engaging, inviting you to actually participate in the story that God is writing in you and the story that God is writing through you. You know what? As, as a church, we there is so much that unites us with the churches of, of Christian faith all around the world. We've all got our little idiosyncrasies, styles and approaches but pretty much the essence of the story is that God wants to be known and he wants to be known through us, to know God and to make him known. And I think if we were to boil it down and on the screen beneath me, it'll actually say the Psalm 1 verse 3. It says, he, she, they will, he will be standing firm like a flourishing tree planted by God's design deeply rooted by the brooks of bliss, bearing fruit in every season of their life. They are never dry, never fainting, ever blessed, ever prosperous. What a promise to us. What an invitation to us that God longs to connect with his creation. And that as being uh, those children of God now connected into the family, grafted in, abiding in, resting in, that we then have this promise that we are deeply and firmly established, that our leaves don't wither and that we bear fruit in every season as we are planted by brooks, of bliss. I think that's absolutely fantastic. I'd love you to see this concept of connect, care, and engage. Maybe we could see this concept of connect as a door. We could see care as a funnel, and we could see connect almost as a bullseye, like a, like a rifle scope. If we saw this connect as being a door, we could actually parallel it with Re Revelations 3.20. We've read this verse before. Revelations 3.20 says, Behold, I'm standing at the door knocking, if your heart is open to hear my voice and you open the door within, I will come in with you and I will feast with you and you will feast with me. What a brilliant picture of God coming to connect. It's actually a picture of how Jesus, in Jesus' day, a wedding ceremony would actually start. It was the groom and the father of the groom would go to the bride's home. They would go and they would knock on the bride's door. And if she actually opened the door wide, it was actually saying, I will be your bride. That opening of the door was a sense of agreement. But the groom being Jesus, the father of the groom being our father, God, are coming to the door of your heart and, and just asking that you may open the door of your heart to him, that he, we may feast together. And in fact, we may enjoy relationship and union and fellowship and a, and a flow of peace and joy from heaven to earth. The connection point 
is not just that we would be connected to God, but that from that place, we will be connected to others. So connect, we move into care, that funnel, that sort of moving us from wide open spaces into something maybe a little more narrow. That actually says, you matter to God. And if you matter to God, you matter to us as a church. And But we want to connect you, but we God loves you too much to leave you where you are. He's wanting to draw you down and draw you into purpose, which is where engagement comes in. This engagement, this this rifle scope, this bullseye, so to speak, actually really says that there is a place and there is a purpose for you. We say this all the time. You're made on purpose for a purpose. You're here for a reason. Beloved, I want to start today by talking about this concept of connect. God coming to connect with us, but not just resting it there saying, no, we have mission. Um, Gary and Isaac and Catherine did such an outstanding job last week talking about being a church on mission. I'm so proud of what even COVID-19 has actually revealed in our faith, that we have been throwing some of the biggest curveballs and some of the greatest challenges that the modern church has known. And it has continued to reveal the heartbeat of God's children, to love one another, to care for one another, and to actually draw even more intimately into that relationship that he has through this connection point. His heart, his passion is to connect with you. This is why he came. John 3, 16 and 17. I won't, I won't write up all these verses, but you can see that there. John 3, 16, 17 says, For this is how much God loved the world. He gave his one and only unique son as a gift so that now everyone who believes in him will never perish, but experience everlasting life. In verse 17, it says, God did not send his son into the world to judge and condemn the world, but by but be its savior and rescue it to, to live from the very sustenance of his hand of power. We see Jesus introduced coming to connect with his kids, coming to connect with his creation in Luke 2, 9 and 11, where angels introduce themselves to shepherds, the workmen of the day. Don't be afraid, for I have come to bring you good news and the most joyous news the world has ever heard. And it's for everyone, everywhere. This is God's desire for your life and every area of your life. And I'm here to promise you, beloved, there's nothing and nowhere in your life that he was not willing to touch and transform and, and transition into something which is honoring for him, good for you, and actually changes the world that you live in and the world I know that you love. Because we resemble Jesus. In Mark 10, 45, it says, the son of man did not come expecting to be served, by everyone, but to serve everyone and to give his life as a ransom for many. Again, this sense of I've come to make a way for you, come to actually be the word made flesh. And as we read this in John 1, 13, 15, it says, Jesus was not born of human parents, of natural means or man desires. It wasn't a mummy and a daddy who loved each other very much, deciding that they wanted to have a baby. It says, no, he was born of God. And so this living expression became a man and lived among us. Paul goes on to, sorry, John goes on in verse 15 to says, he is the one set your hearts on him. He desires to connect with us, embody how we live a life of intimacy and authority, how we get to live in joy and triumph and victory that all comes from our identity with him, all comes from being connected with him. Now, we're not going to leave this here. I want to, I want to move towards playing you a short video in just a minute. But his, the clarity of his love says, you are mine. But from this position, it says, now go forth and be mine. The great commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And the second one is love your neighbor as you love yourself. Are all precursors, are all foundations for going into the world. We can't actually say that we actually would love God without loving our neighbor, without inviting our neighbor, without reaching out to our neighbor, without serving our neighbor, without connecting with our neighbor. I'm so grateful that Jesus came. Jesus came and actually fulfilled that great commandment of loving his Lord and his God with heart, soul, mind and strength. We couldn't do it. So he came and did it. And by the fact that we've been placed in him through our faith, we actually are placed into that victory that we have done this. And now we work it out. 
Now we outwork it, step it out with great joy. I'm wondering if you'd like to write in the comments bar that we're making his passion our priority. And then in capital letters, why don't you write people? His passion, our priority, and it's people. Thank you for writing that in, even as we're speaking. This word connect has got a whole bunch of different meanings. It means to become joined. And we understand that in a whole raft of different ways. But if we would think of two rooms being joined, connected with a hallway, we actually see heaven connecting with earth. Let your kingdom come, Jesus taught us to pray. Let your will be done. Let heaven and earth be connected that his glory, his goodness, his kindness would flow. This is the connection that he wants into us. And this is the connection he wants through us. Connection, uh, if we think about a connecting flight, it's transferring people from one point to another point, from a starting destination to a final destination. That's good, right? He wants to connect from a starting destination to a final destination, this sense of transferring passengers. He has come to transfer us from orphans to sons and daughters. John 14, 18 says, I promise I will never leave you helpless, abandoned as orphans, I'll come back with you. I'm connecting you from an old identity into a new one. In this video that I want to show you, it's the story of blind Bartimaeus, and it's an amazing video. In it is a particular line as Jesus connects with Bartimaeus, and he then starts to pursue Jesus and tell his story to everyone. I was blind, and now I see. I was lost. I'm now found. And this story of, of Bartimaeus, he renders this line. He says, what amazes me is those who should have had the best sight are often the most blind. If we think that all we are about is connecting with God and not connecting with others, we find ourselves blind. You too sang in, in one of their songs, no one is blinder than he who will not see. It's our prayer today as we come back after this video that we'll start seeing both what Jesus has done for us and through us in the clearing of the temple and that indeed what he wants to do again through us as we remove the roadblocks to a world which is so hungry to have blind eyes open, to have chains removed, to have their hearts healed and to have their purpose restored. Enjoy this video and we'll see you again in just a few minutes. You first have to understand the noise, the, the crowd. I could hear that they were close onto the road. And, and not just because I had great hearing to make up for my blind eyes. I mean, this was a roar. People cheering and clapping and singing. As they got closer, I, I I tried to listen as carefully as I could, see if I could make out what they were saying. I knew that they were coming my way. See, some of us sat by the main gates where most of the people would come and go. I know people by how they walk, whether they drag their feet or not. And every day I just sat there, and waited for mercy. But I, all I could do was listen. Suddenly, I realized that they cheered for him. Some grumbled even speaking his name. Others said he was the Messiah. But a handful of them had, had witnessed him healing people. I crawled closer to the road, afraid that I might be trampled. I, I could hear that there were a lot of people coming. Is that him? Is that the teacher? Anyone? Tell me. Is it him? And someone said, yes, it was Jesus. And to this day, I, I can't explain it, but I just yelled. I yelled louder than I had ever yelled. Son of David! Have mercy on me! He heard me and he, he came over where I was and asked what I wanted. 
to see. And then, everything I had always hoped to lay my eyes on was there before me. I followed him that day, and the next day, and the next day. What amazed me was, it seemed like the people that could see the best were the most blind. As for who I say he is, one day, I was yelling for him to heal me. Now, here we are in Jerusalem, yelling to all those who have ears to hear that he is Hosanna in the highest. He is the Messiah. Well, I really hope you got something out of that video. I was incredibly moved the first time I saw that. What an incredible rendering of that story of Bartimaeus. I was blind and I called out for mercy and Jesus stopped with his physical hands, touched my eyes, connected with me and didn't just restore my sight, but restored my identity, restored my purpose, restored my dignity. As Bartimaeus cried out for mercy, God connected with him. And beloved, we've spent this morning starting to unpack his desire to connect with you. And now he wants us to be involved in the stories of others. A whole world crying out for mercy. Mercy, would you lift the, the darkness in my soul? Would you lift the pain in my head? Would you, would you lift these, these chains around my heart? Would you restore my identity, my dignity, my authority? Would you put me back onto a path of purpose and power and dignity? We want to invite you into being part of the story of connecting now with others and how Jesus is actually done so much for us and in us. And now he wants to do stuff through us. Hopefully this morning you'll hear and you'll hear the voice of God speaking to you. This is how I want you to do it. This is how you can do it. These are the unique and beautiful and creative ways that you can reach out and love your neighbor. You could reach out and, and minister in your workplace, not just using religious rhetoric and teaching, but acts of love and service and joy and peace. We read already in Psalm 1 that says the person who is walking connected with the Lord is like a tree planted steadfastly by streams of water, yielding its fruit in season, and whose leaf doesn't wither, and whatever they do prospers. You know, God has come to establish us, not just in Him, but to bear fruit. And we've said already that His passion is going to become our priority, and that is people. It starts with believing, it's moved forward by receiving, and then it is outworked by producing fruit in the lives of others, letting our stories and letting our experiences and letting our gifts serve and invite others to know the healer, to know the savior, to know one who wants us as his best friend. But we have this conundrum. We know what he wants from us, but we get stuck in a malaise. Let me read from you from the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He says, one of the great tragedies of life is that men seldom bridge the gulf between practice and profession, between doing and saying. A persistent schizophrenia leaves so many of us tragically divided against ourselves. On one hand, we proudly profess certain sublime and noble principles but on the other hand, we sadly practice the very antithesis of these principles. How often are our lives characterized by the high blood pressure of creeds and in the anemia of deeds? Man, that's a quote. How often are our lives characterized by a high blood pressure of creeds and the anemia of deeds? Jesus didn't suffer this. He meant what he said and he said what he meant and then he backed it up with action and ultimately action of dying on the cross. He established that by coming back into Jerusalem. And you may want to find Matthew 21. There's 21 verses here that we won't go through all of them today. And we will pick up the story of the fig tree 
next week. We'll just concentrate this morning on the clearing of the temple and what that actually meant for us and what it's meant to example or exemplify for us to do for others and to do in our workplaces, our homes and our sports clubs as we come back into community. In Matthew 21, it says, Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey and they all cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna. He goes into the temple courts and again finds money changes and people selling doves. This is actually the second time that Jesus has cleared the temple. He cleared the temple in John, early in John, not long after his very first miracle in Cana. He cleared the temple then with whips and cords. This time he's clearing them again as a preparation for his, his final act of love, and that is to um, die on the cross. Upon entering Jerusalem, it says in verse 12, Jesus went directly to the temple area, the temple courts, outside the holiest of holies, outside the place of worship, outside the place of offering, the temple courts outside, and he drove away the merchants who were buying and selling their goods. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the stands of those selling doves, and he said to them, my dwelling place will be known as a house of prayer, but you've made it a hangout of thieves. He came and he was so incensed by those standing on the outside, not letting people come inside freely, that they would not allow people to connect. They would not allow people to find forgiveness. They would not allow people to find hope without harrying them and harassing them with a whole bunch of rules and regulations and stipulations. It goes on, when he had driven them out, it says in verse 14, the blind and the cripple then came into the temple courts. Can you picture this? He's driven out the money changers, he's driven out the dove sellers, and into the temple courts come the blind and the crippled, and he healed them all. You know, I love what Martin Luther King said. He said, what is it? We, um, we, are, built, we are not bridges, we are barriers. There is seldom bridge the gulf between practice and and profession. As we are people who are connected and then called to connect, called to love, commissioned to go and invite, to share the light, let your light shine before men and that they may see your good deeds and glorify God, that they may taste the salt of your life and go, I am thirsty for that truth and that hope. Are we barriers or are we bridges? Are we connectors or how we broken bridges that, that in, in, not enable people to come in to his, to his holiest of holies? It says in verse 15, when the chief priest and the religious scholars heard the children shout, shouting and saw all the wondrous miracles of healing, they were furious. The Aramaic, Aramaic actually says it seemed evil to them. And they said to Jesus, don't you hear what these children are saying? This is not right. And Jesus answered, yes, I hear them. I hear them. And I'm going to tell us, beloved, that Jesus is hearing the cries of people. He's hearing the cry for help and wholeness and truth. He's hearing the cry for connection and relationship, something steadfast, something to build their house upon because they've built houses on sand. Storms have come and it's been knocked over. It's been clattered and, and inundated with rainwater and they're searching and seeking and shouting out for something that you and I carry. I love the fact that he entered Jerusalem. It says when they actually cut down branches and they laid their cloaks down, Palm trees were an ancient symbol of victory, of faithfulness. These palm trees symbolized well-being and victory. It was triumph and joy right throughout the ancient world on, on colonnades and coins. The palm tree signified fruitfulness, faithfulness and victory. It was a cause of celebration in triumph. When Jesus entered into Jerusalem, the people there knew exactly what was going on. I want to tell you, I don't believe the world has a problem with Jesus. It has a problem that they can't find Jesus in the church. And we are being the church. We are called to go and not just go to church, but be the church, be the invitation, be the city on a hill, be the salt and be the light, be the candle on top of a table, not hidden under a, a blanket. Don't hide a candle under a blanket, by the way, it'll set fire. But you don't put a candle under a cup. We're called to be these things. Can the world find Jesus in the church? 
Or have we set up rules and regulations that says, I can't invite you yet because what if you think about me this way? I'm fearful or I've been discouraged for the last dozen times I've invited people into gathering or into conversation or, or just tried to love on them. They've, they've, been, they've seen me as being suspicious or, or wanting something from them, not just wanting something for them. I'm wondering if you'd like to type into the comments bar now that he came so that we would go and he wants us to connect. He came so that we would go and connect. Why don't you just type that in now as a statement over his purpose and the power at play in your life that he would actually be doing these things. What did he do? He cleared out the temple courts. I love the fact that he, he cleared out the, the money changers and those selling doves. We understand that, that Jerusalem, Israel at the time was under Roman law. And so their currency was Roman. But Levitical law said that you had to pay your temple tax with a Jewish coin called a half shekel. So all of their daily currency was Roman. But in order to pay the temple tax, they had to have a half shekel. So that was why the money changers were there. It was just convenient for them to be able to exchange their Roman currency for Jewish currency and go and pay the temple tax. Jesus turned those tables over, not that he didn't want people to be able to observe that, but he said, there is a hindrance for that. I'm looking for something more. He had introduced to the woman at the well in John 4 that you guys worship on a mountain, you guys worship in a temple, but a time is coming, he said, and has now come that you will worship me in spirit and in truth. And you don't need to be held out from my presence because of money. You don't need to be held outside of my love and my grace because you haven't done religious observance, ritual, tradition, all those trappings that come. And he turned those tables over because he said, I don't want people to not enter into my presence because of this. It's causing a false relationship. You think you've paid your way. You think you've done your duty. You think you've done the religious things which make us appear right in the eyes of men. But God is looking for something in our hearts, beloved. He's looking for the fruit of a life connected with him. I love the fact that he went to the dove sellers. There was a couple of different types of sacrifices people could offer. The most pleasing was the lamb. And we understand that Jesus was the lamb of God, the ultimate suffering and the ultimate sacrifice for sin. But there was provision also made in Levitical law that if you couldn't afford a lamb, you could afford two young doves. And so Jesus is understanding that what is happening here is the poor are being held out because they were actually exploiting the poor and extorting money from them to buy the doves. And, and that, that was actually really upsetting to him. And, and he said, hang on a second, say, you can almost say, hang on a second, am I exploiting the poor? No, but are we a bridge for the poor, beloved? Please don't hear this with condemnation. Please don't. I'm not hearing this in my own heart, but I'm asking myself, am I a bridge for the poor? Or am I setting up um, all these stipulations that oh, you have to be this, you have to do that. I'm too scared or I'm too worried or I'm too concerned or I'm too busy to actually be a bridge from your brokenness into his presence. Jesus doesn't want the poor exploited. He wants them invited. He doesn't want the poor held out because of the, a need to sacrifice two doves. He says, I want you and a surrendered heart, a willing servant, someone who is bearing fruit in and out of season to be the invitation to that. Jesus came to connect with us. And when he had removed the money changes, when he had removed the dove sellers, that was when the poor and the crippled came in and he healed them. Can you hear the father's hearts cry in this? Can you hear his invitation to do the same things in your own heart? Can I hear the invitation to do those things 
in my heart to remove the money changers, to remove the dove sellers, that the poor and the lame and the broken for the seeking and the weary and the heavy laden to come to Jesus that I would invite them to because I'm not preoccupied with transferring currency into half shekels or I'm not preoccupied with saying, well, even if you can only just give a dove, I can sell that to you when actually I want to be that for you. Jesus comes and he tra- challenges the traditional golden calves and its powerlessness. The Pharisees couldn't see it. They said, do you hear what they're saying? Jesus answers, have you not heard what God has said? I've ordained praise from the lips of my children. He's basically saying, haven't you been listening to the poor? Haven't you been listening? They've been gathered. They just couldn't come in. They couldn't even come into the temple courts because of the traditions that you'd set up. Your unwillingness to make a way when I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He says, yes, I hear them. Yes, I hear them. But you have heard them and stayed silent. Again, if I could quote Martin Luther King, in the end, we will be remembered not by the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. I can't help shrug off this image that I have of standing at a funeral of a beloved child and someone approaches me and says, listen, I'm so sorry for the loss of your child, but I have here an antidote that will cure you and the rest of your family. If I'd I'd sort of known how sick they were, I could have given you this antidote earlier and it would have saved your child, would have saved you the pain, would have saved you the anguish Here is this antidote now. I would have said, where were you three days ago? Where were you of those endless nights of sitting beside a hospital bed? The only sound in the room was a a beeping of of a machine. Where were you then? You had the antidote then. You had the invitation then. You had the you had the authority then to give that antidote to me and to my son, to my child. How would I feel in that moment? How can I, knowing that I have something so good and so pure and so free, not invite a brother or a sister, a family or indeed a whole community to come and know the healer, the source of eternal life, the lover of my soul, who didn't come to judge and condemn, but to offer eternal life. How could I hold that Back. Yes, I hear them. And so I invite my friends and I invite my family and I send out the invitations on Facebook and we continue doing things online and in person. And we take the moments where the Holy Spirit unctions us to stop and have a conversation. Gary and I had a conversation with a, a friend of our church this, this very week as he came into the building and was doing some things. And we said, hey, I just want you to know that we're here for you and your family. Are you doing okay? Okay. And what ensured was a very simple conversation, not a conversion, but a very simple conversation that assured this good man who'd been in and out of the church for a decade that we actually existed for him. We were here for him and his family. We affirmed his value as being a good father and said, you know what? We would love to be involved at any stage of your life. That is so simple, friends. If our hearts are alive to what he wants to do, if our hearts like temples have been swept out of money changes and dubs, if we've heard the cry of our people. You know, next week, we're going to move into the continuation of this story of looking at the fig tree. And it's a tough story because it's a story of a tree which is being a hypocrite. It's a play acting and a a fig tree that's only got leaves and no fruit. We'll get into that and we'll get into why Jesus is so upset with that false tree and how he actually doesn't want that for our own lives, how he doesn't want that for his church, how he doesn't want that for this season, but that this season would actually reveal him in us and reveal him through us. My time is done, friends, and I guess all I can encourage us is practically Maybe write a list of some people, even right here and right now, of some people that God's been laying on your heart this week. 
You are good people. You are people of courage and boldness and faith. I see it in you. I hear it in your conversations. I'm reading it in posts and I'm receiving encouragement. We're hearing story after story about a conviction to care. I'm so proud of you. He is doing good things in you and he's inviting you to do even more. Not bad, but better. This is the word that he spoke to me this week. You're not bad, but I want better for you. So as God is whispering people's names to you, situations from the last week, he said, I I could have worked there. I could have spoken there. I could have moved there. It's not condemnation. It's invitation for the next step. And if people is whispering to you a name, a family, a situation, We just get to say, Father, your passion is going to become my priority. Father, I believe that you want to work in me and work through me. I have a quote here. It says, the smallest act of kindness is worth more than the greatest intention. I know we have great intentions, but let's start with the smallest act of kindness, connection, invitation, Be brave, be courageous, understand that Jesus has come to connect with your friends and your family just as much as he wants to connect with you. Have faith in his word and in his passion. Have faith in the way that he will use you practically this week. Maybe a connect group can help with that. Maybe a message to us via Facebook, a hello at Abundant. We might be able to set some people to help you and journey with you and mentor you through those conversations. But let's do something. It would be remiss of me if I didn't have an opportunity to pray with you right now. Because if you haven't yet had a chance to connect in with Jesus as our own personal relationship, it's not watching church online It's not having been to Sunday school. It's not even owning a Bible. It's not even reading a Bible. It's actually accepting an invitation. Romans 10.10, we've quoted this for the last nearly 13 weeks. For with the heart one believes and thus is made righteous, right standing with God. And with the mouth one confesses and thus has salvation. And so today in your heart, you say, I believe in you, Jesus. I don't have to understand it all. Understanding grows and understanding comes, but it starts with believing. And then it starts with confessing and then receiving his love. And we say this through a beginner's prayer, A, B, and C. I admit that I've got it wrong. I believe that you love me and I commit my life to you, confessing how much I need you. And I'm wondering if you would pray this prayer along with me right now. Dear Lord Jesus, I admit that I have fallen short. I've sinned and need your forgiveness. I believe that you lived, died and rose again. So that I could be connected to God. I confess you as my Lord. And commit my life to you. I give you my past present and future. Take my life and use it. I give it to you. Amen. Friends, there's an opportunity right now for you to hit a little button and say, I'm committing my life to Jesus. There's an opportunity on the other side of that simple raised hand to begin a conversation with some of our friends online, some of our hosts online, and we can start taking those next steps together. There's one thing to be given a cake. There's another thing to be able to eat that cake and We want you to be able to enjoy every drop of what Jesus has got for you. We're about to go into a a wonderful worship song from our, our team. It's the God of Revival. And I trust that it will minister to you. I trust that you can sing along. I'd encourage you to stand wherever you are. I'd encourage you to if, raise your hands if it's an, uh, that universal um, symbol of surrender. And we'll be back with you in just a minute. See what you can do, oh God of wonder. 
power has no end The things you've done before In greater measure You will do again Cause there's no prison wall you can't break through No mountain you can't move All things are possible there's no broken body you can raise No soul that you can save All things are possible The darkest night You can light it up You can light it up Get a revival Let hope arise Day is overcome You've already won Get a revival You rose in victory And now you're seated Forever on the throne So why should my heart feel You've defeated I will trust in you alone Cause there's no prison Wall you can't break through No mountain you can't move All things are possible There's no broken body you can't raise No soul that you can't save to possible
city Who got a revival Pour it out, pour it out Every struggle will crumble My healing shades hit the ground Who got a revival Pour it out, pour it out Good morning, good church. Morning. It's so good to be with you this morning. If you do not know who we are, we are the infamous Teresa and Bonnie. And we're just here to let you know of a couple of things happening in our online church. Also, how great was that worship? Amazing. It's just As so always. good every week, every week. Yeah. Um, so we would just like to let you know that there is a connect button up in one of these corners. And if you press those, we can get in contact with you and then we can set you up in a um, connect group and get you connected within our community. It's such a great um, resource mm, to use and absolutely. it's just, and it's so much fun as well. There's also a live prayer button down here is somewhere and if you press that it's completely anonymous and you can have one of our beautiful leaders get in contact with you and stand by you um, to pray with you mm. so yeah we would love to be in contact with you uh, there's another sneaky button yes there is and there's a giving button up there also and just because we're online doesn't mean that we can't still give and so if you click that button you'll get all the details um, to be able to help partner with us in helping not just um, our own community, um, but globally as well. Yeah, that's great. Um, so this week we have to keep learning online and be engaged. We always have our Facebook Lives. Yep. So this week we have, of course, Pastor Matt bringing in the word on Monday, tomorrow um, at 6.30 a.m. On, <laughs> on Facebook Live. Um, and that will be later uploaded to YouTube and Spotify. Yep. So if you miss right. it at 6.30, then you can also catch it on Spotify and YouTube. We have uh, Living What We've Learnt on Tuesday nights with some of our team at Abundant. So that will be really great. That's as, always great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, and then Wednesday nights we have the Q&A with Pastor Matt and Pastor Karen, uh, which is just always amazing. Love mm. your honesty, guys. It's just, it, yeah, it's great. Um, and then Thursday nights we've also got the new Stories of Me uh, people sharing their amazing stories of what God has done in their lives. So those are the ways that you can stay in contact with us and connect with us and keep learning uh, during this time. So yeah, um, and we also just wanted to thank you for being such a generous church. Yeah. Um, and that if you always if you miss any of these Facebook lives, you can catch them on YouTube and Spotify. Um, so you're never missing out. And, and that's at Abundant Life Church Tasmania on YouTube. Um, and we've also got a worship playlist by our amazing, amazing worship pastors on Spotify. And it's called Abundant Life Worship. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nearly, well lost it, nearly lost it there. <laughs> so, if you check that out, there's some bangers on there to help you get through the week. And, yeah. So, that's all from us. And yep. what do we usually say? Go and love somebody. Go and love somebody. Bye. Well, thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, Teresa. You're superstars. We so love you guys. Amazing. And to our worship team, again, you guys work so hard. And so thank you. We can't wait to see what's coming up for us next. Hey guys, we are continuing to uh, work on plans for re-entry in person. We're going to keep this online church happening. We are excited about coming back into in-person church. We're still working through COVID safe plans so that we can be embracing as many people as we can, as safely as we can, and in a manner that actually really celebrates and, and satisfies, not just trying to squeeze 25 or 30 people into a building and having to hold others out. So. Thank you for your patience as how we do that. 
Our connect groups have gone back and they've got a whole series of things around them, which is as an official church gathering. That actually means that they are also COVID safe. If you'd like to be in one of our small groups, our connect groups midweek, they're meeting in person and we still have meetings happening in Zoom. Again, why don't you hit the connect button or email us at hello at abundant.org.au. That's absolutely brilliant. Guys, we are, uh, we are back tomorrow morning, 6.30 for our, our morning devotion. It's played on our podcast on Spotify at um, Abundant Life Church Tasmania, as well as on YouTube later on the day, also Abundant Life Church Tasmania. And there's a raft of different ways that we can be meeting, connecting, loving, caring throughout the week. I love the statement from the Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien, who was a very good friend of C.S. Lewis, actually, a believer himself. It actually says, it's the job that's never started that takes the longest to finish. There's some wisdom in that. So guys, we are starting the job. We are starting the process. We are starting this sense of connection. We're not giving up. We're not becoming weary of doing good. And I want to thank you for your perseverance, for your faith, for your courage. Thank you that you have got a little more time before we come back into in-person church. But until then, I look forward to seeing you next week in our online church. God bless you as you go and love somebody.